uh, welcome everyone. It's the morning here in California, but some of you are on the East Coast, so it's the afternoon. Um, I'm so thrilled that Rabbi Lisa Hochberg Miller and I are co hosting the series on aging. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice way to collaborate, uh, taking advantage of Zoom, the wonders of technology. So, um, Lisa, Rabbi Lisa is going to uh, introduce our speaker for this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks, Suzanne. This is a uh, this has been so lovely having Temple Beth L and Temple uh, Beth Torah come together and just share in this topic on we've been calling it aging gracefully or the grace of aging. Um, how do we come into this time period in in our lives with some wisdom and with some insight and um, able to make the most of it. So we've been able to bring three remarkable rabbis. I'm so excited to have Rabbi Edris here with us today. Um, we, we heard first from Laura Geller, who spoke with us about how to um, invigorate this time period and look at this age in our life very differently, um, a, a new age of life that perhaps hasn't really been um, named as an age or stage of life before. And uh, last month, we had the chance to hear from Rabbi Doug Cohn, who um, spoke with us about how we encounter illness during this time period. And specifically, we spoke about um, dementia. Rabbi Richie Address, we, we sort of saved for the last because we knew that, that Rabbi Address would be able to sort of pull everything into just a, a huge, big um, cosmos in a way for us. The entire arc, that big, the, the arc of dealing with issues of aging, um, when, what it means when you are watching parents age and um, seniors that are very dear to you age, how we help them and support them, what some of those dynamics might be. What does it mean when we're the ones who are aging? We have to turn to our kids and uh, younger family members to help us. So he's a perfect person to speak to this topic with us. And of course, from a, from a Jewish perspective, um, because Rabbi Address is the founder and director of JewishSacredAging.com. You can find that online and I hope you'll go there. It's a beautiful website with some wonderful articles. I'll put that actually in the chat, JewishSacredAging.com. Um, he is well equipped to have created JewishSacredAging.com because he served for over three decades on the staff of the Union for Reform Judaism. He was a regional director back in the days of regional directors. Um, and then back in 1997, and I remember it so well, Richie, um, he founded and directed the URJ's Department on Jewish Family Concerns, which really opened up the reform movement to take a look at what was going on in the inner life of families and how we support families through social dynamic issues. He's been a specialist, a consultant in the North American reform movement in all of these areas related to family programming, um, family issues. He is, you would not be surprised, an ordinate from the Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary, the Jewish Institute of Religion back in 1972, and uh, has sort of a special place for us here because he began his, his career serving congregations in the LA area. Um, he also served as a part-time rabbi for Temple Beth Hillel in Carmel, New Jersey, while he was a regional director, um, and he served at Congregation McCor Shalom in Cherry Hill. New Jersey as well. So he has experience both institutionally, organizationally, and in congregations, and most importantly, in life and in uh, Menschlichkeit. So he, he is a wonderful speaker for us today. And we look forward to learning with you and studying with you today, Rabbi Address. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. I'm mute. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Boker Tov for those of you in the West and uh, for those of us on this end, how you doing? Um, it's a beautiful day in southern New Jersey, usual, cloudy, a little bit drizzly. Uh, in other words, normal. Um, so here we go. Uh, I'm, I guess some of you may have been migrants from the East Coast, but um, we'll see. Here's my, here's my job with you uh, this afternoon, this morning. Um, and that is to really talk about aspects of intergenerational caregiving. Uh, you've heard from Laura about uh, some of the things, and, and by the way, uh, if you want to hear more from her, we do a weekly podcast as part of our Jewish Sacred Aging called Seekers of Meaning. Uh, Laura uh, was on uh, when the book was just published last year, and you can go to the website, and I put the website in the chat and just search her name. The, the, the Seekers of Meaning 
come out every Friday. A new one comes out every Friday. And uh, we really just deal with issues related to um, family life, our life. And as we get older, and the, the, one, the, one, the young woman who's on right now this week is um, it's developing a program dealing with congregations, dealing with trauma. It really grew out of the, um, really grew out of the uh, pandemic. So caregiving. Caregiving uh, is, is the number one most requested workshop that we do about of about a dozen or so programs that we regularly do for congregations. Um, because it, first of all, it's a new life stage. Uh, there's always been caregivers, but thanks to a whole series of uh, wild cards, everything from medical technology to sanitation to public health, uh, et cetera, caregiving is now a life stage. And you enter this life stage usually not voluntarily. Uh, most people I know who are caregivers, me included, didn't wake up one morning and say, you know, this is what I like to do for the next maybe five, 10 years of my life. I, I would like to restructure my entire life and the life of my family around taking care of someone. I, a lot of times it comes randomly with a phone call uh, and it can last not only weeks, but months, as I'm sure Doug mentioned to you and uh, every colleague has had this experience. Uh, when you deal with certain types of illnesses, not the least of which now with dementia and Alzheimer's can last uh, well into a decade or more. So caregiving restructures everything. So what I want to try and do is give you some background, general background, and then walk you through very briefly the corpus of Jewish texts that speak to this. And you're going to be amazed, I hope, uh, that the body of Jewish texts that speak to this. So, um, and, that, and not only that, that anticipated stuff that we're all dealing with. Uh, so there's about 18 people on the call. Half of you are, I don't see, because all I see is the black uh, screen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that you're there. Um, just by a show of hand, you have to say anything because you're all muted. It's Razor. How many of you are or have been caregivers? Okay. Not as many as, well, I can't see the people who are like watching the masters. Uh, it's not on yet. So, um, and the Phillies don't play till tonight and you can skip it because they're going to lose. The, um, the background of this is very, very profound because as you know, the demographics of the American Jewish community is, are shifting. They're shifting rather dramatically. We right now figure of the anywhere, depending on which uh, population survey that you read, uh, for, which has anywhere from 5.7 million people identify as Jews is the one that just came out uh, last month, where there's close to 7 million people who identify as Jews. It depends on how you ask the question and how people identify. Anywhere between 20 to 25 percent of the American Jewish community right now are people over the age of 65. And the, we are an aging community. We are below replacement level. The fastest growing cohort of this are people over the age of 85. And the fastest growing sub cohort of that are people over the age of 100. You are under no obligation to believe anything I say to you today, but uh, the study guide that we're going to show you and that it's in the thingy, which I'm sure you can get, all the, 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 the citations are there. So this is documented knowledge, okay? So we, we're dealing with a radical shift in many ways of the demographics of the American Jewish community. Um, and according to the WHO, whether you believe them or not post Wuhan, the percentage of the world's population over 60 will nearly double by 2050, which is not that far away rising from 22 percent to 20 from 12 percent in the united states the census bureau projects that by 2035 that's less than 15 years from now people over 65 and older will outnumber children for the first time that's from an article in the new york times april 23rd 2019 go to the great god google check it out so this th and, and by the way america is not ready for this and most of the congregation, I've been working with this when I started this program 
with the union way back in the 90s. Congregations are just slowly starting to realize this. And the reason is very simple. It has nothing to do with a revelation from Mount Sinai or um, the 405 or the 10 since or the 101, depending upon where you live. I know those roads. I spent half my life on the 101 and the 405, but you can't go on the 405 anymore because it's a big parking lot. So the idea, Felice, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Nice cactuses, by the way. The um, the 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 issue of um, congregations waking up is that many of our generation, baby boom generation, are have left congregations because there's nothing there for them, and so congregations are slowly but surely realizing that you just can't dismiss what in many cases is the majority membership or close to the majority membership of a congregation who has a significant amount of life experience, usually which goes untapped within a congregational setting. So this is part of the change. So here, here's some overall statistics. I'm not going to deal with lots of statistics because statistics are boring unless they're batting averages, uh, but you're not interested in that. There are approximately, and oh, by the way, you can check this out. If you go to aarp.org, go to the caregiving section, look at the last survey that they did with the National Alliance of Family Caregivers, which is usually updated. They had a major study about a year and a half ago. The caregiving statistics in this country will blow your mind. So approximately 50 million people provide care for a chronically ill or disabled family member or friend during any particular given year. They've actually analyzed what a typical caregiver is. It's a woman, which should not surprise you, about 50 years of age, caring for a mom who does not live with her. She's married and usually employed. Most caregivers are women, but what's changing, and this is because of the change in the American family system, two cohorts are now becoming more involved in caregiving, A, men, and B, millenn and, and B millennials. So the about a 20%, according to this survey, of care people who are involved actively in caregiving are millennials, people with the age of, between the ages of 18 and 30. So this intergenerational type of caregiving is no longer an anathema. In fact, in the popular press, you'll sometimes see the concept of sandwich generation. We don't use that in my work. We, we, we don't, because it's not true. For those of you who uh, ever went to a diner in Jersey, I mean, which is haute cuisine where I live. We call this the club sandwich generation. And the reason, the reason why we call it a club sandwich generation is that multi-generational caregiving is no longer unusual. For example, you probably know some people like this, and I guarantee you they're in these either one or both of your congregations. It is no longer unusual for a 65-year-old person to be caring actively for a parent, an elderly parent who may be 85 or 90, while at the same time being actively and intimately involved with their adult children should they live near them. And if, God willing, they live near those grandchildren, they're actively involved in caring for those grandchildren as well, in certain cases, being the primary caregiver. All this time, they say, wait a minute, they told me when I was younger, this would be the golden age. I could do anything I wanted and I'm working harder than I've ever worked before. I'm under more stress than I've ever been before. That is not fiction. Your rabbis know this because they deal with them in their office. And some of you know them because A, you may be them or you know friends of these. So this multi-generational caregiving is no longer unusual. And you can check this out again on the AARP website. There are huge social justice implications for a lot of this. If you have a social justice committee in either one of the congregations, here's something that I urge you to start thinking about. Post-World War II, there are approximately seven workers paying into systems like Social Security for every person who is, quote, retired, unquote. Now, there's less than three full-time workers paying in just at the time when baby boomers, who are the generation now located between 55 and 75, 76 years of age, 
are swelling into the system for Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. Do the math. Do the math. So and and so when these comes these issues come up politically, these are justice, moral, Jewish justice, e equity issues that I urge you to think about. One of the other things that I hope Rabbi Cohen mentioned to you is the fact that we are woefully unprepared for the explosion in dementia and Alzheimer's caregiving. According to the, did he talk about this? No? Okay. According to the Alzheimer's Association, they calculate that right now there's approximately 5 million people dealing with Alzheimer's in the United States of America. Given the aging of our community and the longevity of our community, because remember, baby boomers now, expect, we expect to live into our 80s and 90s. We expect it. We expect it. Given the expected rise, and the, the, the trend is already rising in dementia and Alzheimer's, they predict that within the next generation, a de decade and a half, that number from five is going to swell to about 15 million. There are just not enough people to take care of us. There just physically aren't enough gerontologists, geriatricians, qualified healthcare workers. So the whole health care question, I urge you to read Ajen Poo, P-O-O uh, is her last name. She's a MacArthur Scholar uh, a Fellow. She wrote The Age of Dignity. It is a brilliant must-read book about the changes in health care and, and for the workers like um, um, home health care workers and this revolution is just about to explode. The expenses and the economics of aging, one of the workshops we do is on the economics of aging because the economics of aging is very, very powerful. Each one of us, I'm going to make a guess, but everybody on this call in this class is most likely one financial medical crisis away from financial concern. One. I bet you some of you know somebody who had a medical, a major medical emergency and how to restructure their entire finances. This is another social justice moral issue. One of the great fears of people as we age, one of the great fears is that we will outlive our money. I know this happened to my mom who lived into her 90s before dementia got her at 95, but she outlived her money. And if your sibling, <clears throat> That responsibility falls on you. I was an, I'm an only, I guess I say I wasn't, I guess I'm always an only. And so there was nobody to help. So, and this creates, it's why this caregiving is a multi-generational family systems issue. It is not a singular issue. It is a family systems issue. And if you just take a look in your neighborhoods in Ventura and, and in, out in, in Riverside, the county near Palm, wherever, out the 10, um, what it costs to put somebody in an assisted living facility, even with a double occupancy, La Havdil solo, I guarantee it costs several thousand dollars a month. If you go to a facility that has a buy-in, this is large money. This is big money. If you bring in somebody like I had to do with my mom, and some of you know this too, before they, well, they go into someplace else, but a, a healthcare worker will come in four or five, six hours a day, and you don't have any type of insurance, you, you write those checks. You're writing those checks. You're writing those checks. So this is why this is a family systems issue. It is a very, very, and this is why it's one of the most, if not the most requested workshops. So that's by general background. There's more and almost every day there's another article in one of the newspapers uh, dealing with some of these implications. And this is also part of the new uh, Biden uh, uh, jobs program. It's about $400 million, I think, earmarked for the care economy, which is a great, which is a great name because this is exactly what it is. So I don't know who's in charge of sharing screen, but now I am. I, I will share. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In Leviticus, in Leviticus, revere, tier u, which is sometimes referred, uh, translated as fear, but it really is a sense of respect. So the rabbis ask, what, listen, why, why are they doing this? Why are you flipping back and forth? And one of the answers is because no parent, and this has to do with parents, 
should be allowed to take precedence over the other so it's equal. But the key, the whole thing is honor and respect. So this is Torah. All right, jump down now to the conversation that appears in the Talmud. Bavakasha must speak. Now, in the Talmud, in the Talmud, there is a, a series of conversations where a lot of this stuff is played out. Um, if you go to Safaria, or if you don't believe anything I'm saying, again, you can go to your Talmud, if you have a Talmud at home, and look up Kiddushin 31b to 32a. Or if you have Safaria on your phone, you can do that. But right now, you're going to have to trust me that this is in there. Um, the rabbis then say, okay, we have two words, honor and respect. So they're going to have a conversation. They're sitting around having a cup of coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. And then one guy says, what does it mean to honor? What does it mean to respect? Respect means not standing in a parent's usual place, nor sitting where they usually sit. By not contradicting the parent's words, this was obviously written before the 21st century, or interfering in a parent's dispute with others, okay? Respect, respect, which really concentrates into this wonderful concept, which runs through this entire conversation, especially in bioethics aspects of dignity. So flash on, we're created with Selim Elohim. Dignity, you may not do anything to take away a person's sense of dignity. You may not. That's why if, you're, if your mom is having an argument with her cousin, with your, with your cousin Seal, and you know your mother's wrong, you can't stand there in the deli and say, mom, no, cousin Seal is correct. No. You can't take away a person. You can't embarrass a person. Let's into this. This is this is Talmud. OK, so it's fifth. Let's say, give or take a day or two, fifteen hundred years ago. In the conversation, they understood that money is a means of control. Money is a means of an ability to control another person and remove their sense of dignity. There's a Midrash in the uh, Palestinian Talmud, which goes like this. A father who feeds a son who feeds his father fatted chickens is doomed to hell. A son who gives his father work in the mill is rewarded with Gan Eden, eternal life. It's counterintuitive. The answer is obvious, though, based upon this. Dad, you worked hard. I'm going to take care of you, everything. Don't worry about anything. Everything's okay. Don't worry about it. No. Dad, you should, you know, you, you're, you're moving. You're, I'm working. I'm going to continue working. Why are you working? You worked hard. Because I need to do this for me. You, you can take away a person's dignity by totally manipulating them using money as a control mechanism. Okay. Give you a perfect example. This is a true example. Oh, I got to hurry up. We're almost out of time. A true example. Uh, when my mother was living about a half an hour from here, okay, I would call her up and say, Mom, I shouldn't personalize. They tell you in school, don't personalize things. But I know some of you. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a, going to a, a meeting in Cherry Hill. I'm going to be driving by the apartment. Do you need anything? I, I'm Okay which is, of course, code language for, of course, I need something, you fool. So you sure, mom? I, uh, I said, well, bubbala, another thing, everything with that, with that, everything with a love, bubbala, tatala, manala, could never, it's not in the dictionary. It says, as long as you're passing by, here's, here's a list. So you, you write down the thing, you go to the shop, right? 45 minutes later, you knock on the door, open the door. What's the first thing that my mother would, your mother would say, are you hungry? No, I'm going to a lunch meeting. We go in when he unpack the groceries. There's four bags of groceries, which is not much in this day and age. Your mother turns around and says, how much do I owe you? Now go back to what the Talmud said. I can choose to say, 
that's okay, don't worry about it. Or I can say uh, it's $25. The correct answer is what? You can somebody unmute or yell it at $25. That is correct. That's correct. The Talmud says if your parent is economically able to contribute, that's the right thing. But the subtext of this, this is really brilliant. Look, this is this is Talmudic. This is very brilliant. If you constantly do that, what are you doing to that other human being? You're reducing their sense of self-worth. You're taking away their sense of dignity. Money is a means of control. Dignity also comes in the caregiving aspect, and, and many of us have dealt with this in end-of-life conversations right now. Quality of life. California, like in New Jersey, we have a medical aiding dying law. Um, the issue of quality of life is another workshop that you must do every single year uh, to find out what the Jewish uh, points of view are in this. It's one of our more requested workshops. Quality of life has to do with the sense of dignity. And if there are 21 people in this class, there's 21 different definitions of what dignity is. And that definition can change by the time you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, or 100. And that's very, very important to understand. It's not static, it's fluid. And that's why in the decision-making process, there's, there's a whole series of texts. We don't have the time to go into that now. And when there's a conflict of interest between parents and children, the, the mood of Jewish tradition under this concept of Shomer is that if, you're, if the adult parent is mentally competent when they make a decision, you as the adult child are obligated to follow that decision, even though you may personally disagree with that decision. Every rabbi I know, we include, has had this conversation once or twice or more in their career. I just came from talking to my dad. He wants to be cremated. I can't understand that. I don't agree with it. I'm, going, I'm not going to allow it to happen. But the answer is, no, your dad, when he filled out his advanced directive a couple of years ago, knew exactly what he wanted. We had this conversation. You may have had this conversation with you. You may disagree with it, but you're obligated in the tradition to fulfill his wishes if they were made when he was medically, you know, mentally competent, which most of the times people are, especially as more and more people discuss advanced directives and where they want to, and their wishes at the end of life. Every colleague has had, and mental health professional and counselors had these conversations in a family. This is why this is all family dynamic stuff. It's very, very complex in many ways, because a lot of these decisions, as some of you know, really dredge up family of origin issues that may have been repressed for decades, but all of a sudden around this, whoa, they bubble up, okay? So that's just a little bit of, of concept of tier u, respect. What does it mean to honor? Helping a parent eat and drink, clothing and cover them, helping them go in and out. That means kabed, to honor. And by the way, kabed means to honor, but also as the tradition tells us, it's the same Hebrew root, for the concept of heaviness. And for people who are caregivers for a long time, it can be heavy. We'll talk a little bit about this in a bit, okay? So in the tradition, in the Talmud discussion, the, the Talmud asks who pays? And we just talked about that. But there's another, there's another aspect of this, of who pays, that is fascinating. What's more important? in our culture, time or money? Anybody wanna hazard a guess? Time, canter, rock and roll, very good. Take Yom Kippur off. The, uh, you can do, everybody pre-recorded. I mean, I know, a, I know colleagues, I can, this is like eight months already gone. They pre-recorded everything. And they, somebody found them having lunch from Yom Kippur at the deli. They said, yo, Rabbi, what are you doing? You know, I said, just tune in the TV. I'm there. Uh, so anyway, time. So for example, this is not an unusual scenario. Uh, dad has a 1030 appointment with a cardiologist. You pick him up. 
You get to the doctor's office at 20 minutes after 10, you fill out all the forms, okay? You sit, you read the magazines, if they still have magazines, this is pre-pandemic. Let's say you get called in to see the doctor at 11 o'clock, okay? You go in with, because you may not have this, I had, my mom had selective hearing. Uh, she heard what she wanted to hear and then would report what she wanted to tell me to me. So now we learn, we went in, you take notes. 11.45, the appointment's over. You get in the car with dad, you say, you're hungry. To which the response is, I could eat, which is code language for feed me. You go to the deli, okay? You order, he orders a Kunda sandwich and cup of coffee. Comes, you have the conversation. How can they charge $15 for a corn bis sandwich and a cup of coffee? I remember. Yeah, yes, that was a long time ago. You have lunch. He takes a half a sandwich, wraps it up to take it because that's going to be dinner. This may sound for me. I'm not making any of this up, by the way. You go on your way to the CVS or to the Walgreens or to the mom and pop pharmacy to fill the prescription that the doctor gave you. You go back to Shady, you finally get back to the apartment. It's about two o'clock. Okay. Now, if you're on salary, you have nothing to worry about, hopefully. If you're not on salary, you've just lost that time. Now, if you're a mom or a dad that's in charge of the kids coming home from school at three o'clock or 3.30, you don't go back to work. You go home because you want to be there when the bus comes. What the Talmud says is, we pay through time. The amount of time, this has been calculated, I think the ARP calculated, the amount of time that is lost from production, because this is America and everything is based upon your ability to produce a product. The amount of time that is lost in production has been calculated into the billions, I think, of dollars by, ca by caregivers. I mean, this is all part of this caring economy that they're talking about. But I, I need to let you know that this is part of the Talmudic discussion. This is part of the, the, the Talmudic discussion. Now, there's a couple of other things. You're commanded to honor and we're commanded to respect. We are not commanded to love. And when we do this in a workshop, a lot of times, I say, what do you mean? I say, look, kabed tir u, honor and respect. You're not commanded to love. And this is a major issue. And this is a, something that's so profound in the Jewish tradition that it's unbelievable. We, we don't teach it enough. This has to be earned. This has to be earned. So if, in the book that we did for the union a uh, long time ago for the URJ Press, A Blessed Memory, um, that you may live long. There's an excellent essay in here by um, Michael Chernick, Dr. Chernick, who's a professor at, at this New York seminary, where he unpacks this, unpacks this paragraph, and he unpacks this uh, uh, idea, where he basically says in his commentary that if a, a, an adult parent violates the laws of Torah, they're abusive, they, they hit, They've abandoned. They, by doing that, abrogate the mitzvah of being honor and respect. We rarely discuss this. But Dr. Chernick makes the point in the argument in his essay that this is a two-way street. Both adults, parents, and children, adult children, function on the same moral plane. So that that parent who may have been an alcoholic, a drug addict, and abusive, and who abandons a family and comes back 25 years later and knocks on one of the kids' doors and says, I really need help. You need to help me. If that 
adult child turns around and says, you know something, you violated every aspect of Jewish law, morals, and ethics. You're on your own. They would be within, according to Chernick's argument, within the bounds of appropriate behavior. Can they help if they wish? Yes. But that, that bond of commandment has been broken. This is grist for a tremendous amount of conversation because in both of your congregations, you have this situation. Why not talk about it? I'm a big believer in having these things discussed publicly, which we'll get to more later. Honor and respect are deeds and actions, not feelings. We talked about love. Here's another aspect that comes up all the time, all the time. They'll be sitting in your rabbi's office or your cantor's office, and they're going to say to them, you know, I'm faced with a real ethical and family dilemma. Many years ago, I, my, we were out to dinner with my mom, and we were talking about some of her friends who were going to be in, in, being placed in an assisted living facility or a nursing home. And she looked at me, and, and she pointed her finger at me and says, I don't care what you do. But don't you ever put me in one of those places. But now the dementia is accelerating. Mom fell three times. I'm having trouble picking her up. I'm working. We may have to start bringing in full time healthcare workers. There comes a point where I don't think I'm going to be able to take care of her in the way that she needs to be taken care of. But I made this promise. And if I move mom into my house, my house is not accessible. We have three flights of stairs. And besides, you know, well, you know I've talked to you before, my mom and my, my spouse, they don't necessarily get along. And, and, we, and we have two of our own kids. And what did you do? Maimonides in the 12th century, who was a practicing physician and uh, a subject of, a, of, of I, I suggest you adult education, um, a, a class that you should have, the, came up with the following paragraph. I'm paraphrasing. Could you scroll down a little bit? I don't know whether I actually put that in there. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If an adult child should care, should care for a parent, and we learn it in the Torah, but if it becomes impossible, due to a change in a parent or negative impact of family or a threat to the parent's literally health and safety, it is permissible, this is 12th century, ladies and gentlemen, to cede care to a third party. When you explain this to people who are struggling with this and say, wait a minute, our tradition says it may come, there may be a context where the higher value may actually be to cede care to a third party because they're gonna be in a better position to take care of mom or dad or your spouse or God forbid your child in a better situation than you can. It is permissible and indeed that's the right thing. That is a liberating text for many people because it removes a sense of guilt from their soul. It's important to teach that. Caregiving also is opportunities for spiritual growth, reconciliation of past hurts, and bonding. This is very, very difficult and really marks movement and transition from one life stage to another in many families. Because for many children and adult children, mom and dad represent an idealized person. And then if you're given the blessing of being able to take care of them as they move into their third or literally now the, what is called the fourth stage of life, the frailness, and you hold them and feel the frailness, there is a not so subtle shift in roles. And you understand that now you must take care of them as they took care of you. And this is very, very difficult. For those of us who've had to walk this walk with friends or family members, it is a very difficult walk. It is a very spiritual moment. 
when this transition or transference of roles takes place. Not only from the caregiving and the driving, but some of the challenges can, can, can and I'm sure your rabbis and clergy and have talked, can I toilet my mom, my dad? Can I do that? What does that mean to me spiritually to do that? What is happening to me in my neshama and my soul when I see this is happening? Because is this me in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? So part of this conversation that you have to have is really the understanding that this is a not so subtle reminder of one's own mortality. There are moments when past hurts are put aside and disagreements between generations are reconciled in the face of the overriding need to care. And one of the other things intergenerationally, which is very, very important, is this concept of hishtamer, of self-care. The Hebrew word for guardian or caring is shomer, shamar, and to care one for oneself. We sometimes, for those of us who were faced with, 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 with this uh, commandment and vice versa, we hear what we call the B word, burden. I don't want to be a burden on my children. I don't want to be a burden on my parents. This is something that, this is a spiritual question that has to be, this is a high holiday sermon, by the way. Um, because the Jewish tradition says, on the contrary, you don't do this by yourself. And that's why when I, I started out by saying this is a family systems issue. Um, there is great opportunities for mitzvot, regardless of the generation. So consequently, one of the things that we stress in workshops like this is that every family should at some time as, you, as you're preparing that advanced directive and healthcare proxy, you need to also prepare a care plan, a care plan. This is especially important for multi-sibling families. Who's going to take care of who? God forbid something, and this has nothing to do with just adult children, okay? Uh, adult, uh, adult uh, aging parents. It has to do with spouses, children, siblings. And as many of us know, Proximity to a person who needs care is not necessarily the indicator of who the designated caregiver is. We all have situations where a person needs care and there's a sibling that lives two miles away and another sibling who lives two hours away. And it's the person who lives two hours away who had that role assigned to them growing up. The family of origin stuff is very, very powerful. Very, very powerful. That's why ARP talked about the, who the designated caregiver is in a, in a family, unless you're an only. This is very serious stuff. Because I hope you see the implications on a family system, multi-generational, ex are extremely powerful. And they can be life transforming. They can be. This caregiving stuff is very, very, very important. It's crucial because it is a new life stage. And many people in each congregation have been or are living it. And as I tell people, if you aren't, odds are you're going to have a turn it back. So why not talk about it? If you could continue to scroll down, I got to, I want to finish up with some more institutional stuff. Stop. Thank you. Tada. Our congregation is dealing with this. Here's a, just a, um, a, a run through. Um, a service to honor caregivers. Uh, a lot of, some congregations are doing this. Sometimes they do this out of their caring community committee. We just did, come working with a congregation in, in Florida, we just did a Zoom uh, caring community service honoring caregivers in January. Support groups, respite care programs out of there. So there's a lot of this stuff is being done in certain communities through the Jewish Family Service. Uh, where I am in South Jersey, the Jewish Family Service of Southern New Jersey does a great, does a better job than any congregation can do, and they work in partnership. It's very, very important to, to, to find that out. Some congregations are doing caregiving support groups, caregiver support groups within the congregation, also extremely, extremely important. 
adult daycare. This is going to be more important as the dimension Alzheimer's thing goes up. Some of the care and community pro transportation programs, shopping programs, um, especially uh, in the pandemic. A lot of this has been on a hiatus because of a whole variety of reasons. Um, here's an idea that we've been pushing for almost two decades that has failed. And that is the Congregational Health Worker. It's a spinoff on the Catholic Church's Congregational Nurse Program. There's only one really function, two, I think now down to one, uh, Karen in North Jersey, functioning Congregational Nurse Program. We tried pushing this for years and, and it just never took off. Uh, it just never took off. Um, I still think it's a possibility given the next thing. I think every congregate, I, I think you're, you know, I think the time has also come given the complexities of this, that every congregation should have a congregational patient advocate. This is not to take the place of anybody, but when a, somebody comes into the rabbi or the cantor's office and they're facing all the, they're entering what I call this, this tunnel, this new life stage, and they just don't know where to go. Wouldn't it be interesting if you had somebody in each congregation who, who knows the system, knows the laws of California, some of the laws of Medicare uh, uh, eligibility, local local resources, nursing homes, assisted living, CCRCs, that a rabbi at a cantor can say, look, uh, uh, Joe Feigelblum really knows this system. I'm going to give you his number. He's going to call you and he'll be able to guide you to appropriate places within the community that you could lock on to and really advocate for you and walk you through the system. Because once you enter the system, the system can be intimidating. Health and wellness program. Oh, recognizing of caregivers. This is easy. Costs no money. It's beautiful. God willing, we're back in a synagogue. At least we're going to be hybrid, most likely for the holidays. But one of the aliyahs, uh, and uh, I'm suggesting, I've done this, and it's really powerful. Uh, instead of calling up, you know, the somebody who gave the parking lot or did this or something, just say, we call for the honor of blessing the Torah on Yom Kippur this afternoon or morning or whatever. Everybody who in the last year in this congregation has been or continues to be a caregiver and just have them stand. You'd be amazed who, shut, who stands up. And also it sends a message, you're not alone because caregiving is predominantly a lonely experience. Despite all the support things, eventually it's you, it's you who's going to drive, who's going to go to the appointment. It's you who gets the phone call at two o'clock in the afternoon at the office that your spouse has fallen and you need to get home right away. It's, it's, it is, can be a very singular existence. And that's part of the self-care because it, it can be the stress. There are enough studies on the impact of stress and strain on caregivers and caregivers' health that it's no longer up for discussion. Every time I counsel a family who are about to enter this, I always say to them, one of the things you must do that you're going to not listen to me, but eventually you will, is that you have to make sure you have enough rest, you eat correctly, you exercise, because this can overwhelm you. And if you get sick, you can't take care of the person you need to take care of, regardless of who they are. <laughs> I know. The health and wellness program we talked about that a, a lot of this spins off into workshops and around health and wellness, physical health, mental health, eating, adding your education. This, this is, I, I, I keep telling congregations, you got to do this because there's people who now in the congregation have no knowledge of this and don't need it. A year from now, sometimes something's going to happen that they're going to walk into this walk. Decision making at the end of life, caregiving, mental health, the spiritual caregiving guide for the family. We posted, I did something for one of the organizations I work with called CTAC, called the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, uh, a whole uh, uh, toolkit on how to create a, a, a program within a congregation. They gave me permission. They put it on our website on jewishsacredaging.com. It's under resources. But these types of conversations, an annual educational forum on how to make a Jewish decision at the end of life, this stuff, how to, you know, the art of what does it mean to be a Jewish caregiver, mental health, because people, th this is where this is, is happening in families in each of these, in each of our congregations, regardless, regardless, they're happening. And if we don't 
bring the tradition to people where they live and what they're living through, then they don't need us. They don't need us, Put pure and simple. We're at an age. I don't need any more boba mices, fairy stories, miracle stories, the cockamamie with the oil and this and the waters parted and this. It's nice when you're 12. Doesn't mean Jack right now. Okay. I need to know how to deal with loss. I need to know how to make meaning out of the time I have left knowing as the spiritual question of our times are that no matter what I do, I can't control the amount of time I have left. So what am I going to do with it? Okay. I, only, I, I need to know how to bring a sense of legacy and meaning to me and the people who are coming after me after I die. And I need to know how to figure that out. I need to know how to deal with uh, gradual losses that are impacting me. You know, I don't see as well. I don't hear as well. You know, I had that hip replacement rabbi. I can't walk as well as I used to. The lighting in the sanctuary, the print, you know, now I never even thought of this, but now the, the, the font has to be a little bit. These are gradual losses. People respond to them very, very differently. Some people say, okay, I got to deal with it. And some people say, it's the beginning of the end. How do we begin to talk in a meaningful, Jewishly based way to talk to people of the stuff that they're living through? The gradual losses, the, the gradual diminution of the circle of friends that we have. You know, because when you're 30 and 25 and 35, that circle of relationships is really, really large. And now gradually in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, that circle gets a little smaller. What the hell does that mean for me? It's Genesis 3, which is another workshop altogether we have to be able to talk about the real stuff that's happening in people's lives and understanding that the tradition is forward-looking affirmative growth oriented and faith oriented and says until the moment of your last breath you're alive live it there's this great you can't see this there's this great cartoon snoopy and peanuts at the end of a dock P, uh, Charlie Brown says in, in, in this bubble here, someday we will all die, Snoopy, to which Snoopy responds, true, but on all other days, we will not. That's the Jewish view of aging in a cartoon. You're alive. Deal with it. You have losses. You have random acts deal with you have you make deuteronomy 30 19 you make choices that sanctify life it, it, the, the, this is very very powerful stuff so if you can scroll down okay we're gonna okay oh the new rituals oh this is another workshop i'll just mention this really really this is uh getting a lot of play for this new rituals for new life stages um, the medical uh, directors we talked about, the blessed we have, and we published all this, and it's on the website, and we uh, do a lot of workshops on this. The Simcha Chochma, the celebration of wisdom. I don't know whether you guys do that in your congregations, the two congregations, but I urge you to do it. Uh, there are rituals for welcoming a resident into an assistive living. One of our big rituals that we talk about in the workshop is the removal of a wedding ring after the year of mourning, not for everybody. Um, I know this does not happen in your two congregations, but here where I live in Jersey, this is not such a, you know, they come to the rabbi and say, you know, we met each other. We want you to come and do a blessing because we're going to be moving in together. And the rabbi says, I'll be happy to do the wedding. And Morty says, <laughs> time out, rabbi, illegal use of wedding. We have no intention of getting married. We found each other. I'm 82. She's 78. We've been alone. Being alone is horrible. So we want you to come and say a blessing. So we actually published a couple. This is the one that we've gotten into most trouble with, the redefinition of adultery in light of Alzheimer's. Uh, I don't know whether Doug talked about this, but we talk about this all the time. It's gotten us in a little trouble. And the realization that in all this conversation you've had in these three, we really probably need to redefine 
vocabulary because there's really no competent vocabulary to deal with some of the life stages that we're dealing with now. We're still dealing with Hebrew vocabulary that is uh, centuries old. Finally, uh, this prayer. Um, so just up this a little, must speak. This comes from one of my DMIN students. I teach in the doc, I, right now I'm teaching in three different seminaries. So one of them, uh, works, the Yeshiva Wurzweiler, HUC's DMIN program in the Aleph. Uh, we're doing a class on the philosophy of pastoral care, which is pretty cool. Um, Rabbi Medwin, Michelle Medwin, one of our colleagues, was one of my, I, I was one of her thesis advisors. She went through the DMIN program and she wrote this um, really, really wonderful book as it came out of her DMIN thesis called Alzheimer's Family. So it's really about her dad. Um, and she included this prayer. Now think about this. When you do a, a work, a, an annual Shabbat, let's say that honors caregivers, and in the, with the Mishaberach, sustainer of the universe, listen to the language, is really cool. Help me to care for my loved one with hope, courage, and sensitivity. Grant me insight, resource, resourcefulness, and the ability to ask for help. Now, oh, that is crucial. And to accept help when it is needed. It's a big challenge. May I find the patience to overcome difficult moments and to find meaning and purpose in the smallest task. Eternal God, help me to remember to take care of myself so that I may take care of others. Be with me and my loved one as we journey on this path together. May the one who makes peace in the heavens bring peace to me, to my family and loved ones and to us all. It's a great prayer. Think about you if you institutionalize an annual um, uh, service to honor caregivers, include that with the Mishabera. In conclusion, um, this is a um, major thrust of our community as we age. Um, baby boomers still are managing to take care of some adult parents. And we do have people, I know them, who are in their mid or first stage baby boomers in their 70s that are still taking care of parents in their 90s. And now we have our own children in their 40s who they also are undergoing their changes. And that's why this is in, and they have to start being educated as to what's expected of them with us. That's why that care plan is extremely important. So, to honor and respect Kabed and Tiru, this all stems back, as much things do in our tradition, from how we take a look at very basic sacred text in the Torah, how the tradition has then expanded it. And I, I hope you, you saw that between who pays and, 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 and what it means and to honor and to respect and dignity. Um, and then to branching out into how we deal with this in our own synagogues and mostly how we deal with this in our own families. So if you remember nothing from this, please remember that we're part of a faith tradition that started to talk about this in real terms thousands of years ago. And much of what it said holds, just holds us today and responds to questions in real life situations. Okay, um, all right. That was extraordinary. Um, Rabbi Address, so fruitful and so much to think about and to contemplate and um, and to challenge all of us. And so, yes, take take a drink, take a sip, take a breath. Um, and we'd day. love to take a few moments because I'm sure that the people who have zoomed in today have zoomed in because this is a topic that is uh, personal for them or pertinent either to the work they do or in their family life. So we're going to just invite people if they'd either like to put a, a question in the chat, um, if they'd like to just type it, we can read that. Or if they'd like to raise a hand, um, either, you know, a physical hand or raise their, their uh, Zoom hand, we'd be glad to call on them. 
Um, and we'll, we'll give people a, a chance to do that. I perhaps would like to start with a question. You've spoken about the um, the incredible um, stress right. on families. And there's been a lot um, written lately about the change in families in America that we have lived in nuclear families and that we value our independence and that what we're seeing is a societal change where uh, perhaps we are moving back to extended families or living in um, in ways that bring us together for exactly this reason because we need support and we need um, we need each other as a social institution, not just as a loving, you know, um, support system, um, even to the point that builders of new houses are now building houses right. that are created with either granny flats or places for three generations. Right, um, right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sort of thinking about just the shape. While this feels like incredible stress, do you think and it is incredible stress. You think at some level it might be moving us back into a more holistic way for families to function? Well, I, I think it's an ideal. I would like to think that's just going to happen. And I know that the New York Times had a big piece last year sometime about what you're talking about, Rabbi, about the architectural changes um, uh, as 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 my generation, as, as the... Um, as the baby boomers age, what we're looking for, housing redesign, more accessible, um, single level, accessible for wheelchairs, where lights, light uh, fixtures are and stuff so that people don't have to reach. It, it all, there's all kinds of subtle, not so subtle changes um, that are happening. Whether this is a symbolic of a wholesale return to multi-generational families, I don't know. I think the pandemic is really going to have something to say about this. Yeah. And here's something else that we don't want to talk about that will also factor into this, economics. Um, I'm going to be really blunt about this. For most of the people who are members of our congregations, um, this is something that they consider. They may they may have the economic resources to to restructure a home or or move into a more village type of an experience. Um, for people who don't have the economic means, and the United States of America is an unequal medical uh, country. There is no equity in the distribution of access to medical care on medical health. Period. End of discussion. Um, that really is going to be the greatest, the greatest uh, uh, challenge to this, I, I, I think. And we have to, as a society, really face this. We don't have the courage to do that right now. We just don't have the courage, both emotionally, fiscally, and politically, to deal with this. But eventually, something's going to have to happen. Um, because you have this swelling of uh, the baby boom generation and not all the baby boom generation have 401ks and pension programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people don't, a lot of people don't. And so there will be a drain on the society. And, you know, so look, if I had my way uh, and, and, and by the way, we want to stay independent longer. You know, I, I was just talking, I'm consulting with a, a, a new, newly built, being built CCRC, Continuing Care Retirement Community in suburban Philadelphia. You were talking about this. And I said, uh, my experience in, in this is that whereas a generation ago, the people who are entering these facilities were in their late 50s and early 60s. My sense is that now it's much delayed. And she said, no, the average person coming into one of our facilities is in their mid to late 70s. Huh. We want to, I'm 76 years old, okay? First of all, if somebody says, oh, you're a senior citizen, I'll say, I'll give you a senior citizen, okay? One of the things is congregation struggling with is what are called these groups, the, the vocabulary needs to be readjusted, okay? You know, even though my body is 70, my mental, my mental picture is I'm f about 38 or 40. Um. And, and I believe that. And by the way, that's part of what you have to keep your brain flow. You have to, uh, that's why 
retirement to me is a dirty word. I, I, I never use it. People transition from one life stage to another, but to retire, I saw what it did to my father. But I'll tell you point blank, if I had my druthers, you know, in 10, 15 years, if, you know, and I really need help and, and I'd rather move in with a bunch of my friends. I've actually, I have two friends who've talked about this and take care of each other and pool our economic resources in case we need help. Uh, because I see what happened to my mom when she went into a facility and we, you guys, you know, I want to do everything in my power to stay out of two places, a hospital and a facility. Mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and, and um, <laughs> eventually, <laughs> um, but I, and I do worry about that because look, it's, it comes to the loss of independence. It comes to the loss of autonomy. Uh, and this is a, and this, and in America is still an independent, you know, my autonomy supersedes anything. We're seeing this in the pandemic. You have no right to tell me how to wear a mask. Well, yes, we do. It's a matter of public, it's, 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 it, it, this, so the question you raise is very, very serious. And by the, this is a real implication that you, if you ever follow up with these programs into next year and develop more substantive programs, this would be a very interesting conversation. You know, where do you, where to all the people on this in this class 15 years from now where do you want to be living so no, I, 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 yeah. I just wanted to read you a few things that are in the chat because there's some more questions yeah 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 um, and also some nice comments excellent program thank you now i understand why it was always so important for my dad to pay for everything when we were together so right. that's a big insight that you know right. i think none of us really had before uh, excellent presentation. Didn't the government siphon off a significant amount of money from Social Security that has not been paid back, um, which should be brought up when some politicians claim Social Security needs to be cut? Also, is there any movement where people could live in a more communal setting, which you just talked about, where more older people can support each other? And actually, Rabbi Geller talked about that, about the village, the village movement, the village. Yeah. Movement. And then is there a caregiving guide for an interfaith family? So those are the questions. I don't know of a caregiving guide for interfaith families, although um, we did one that we posted on the website for the for the Jewish community. We did it because there, the, our texts are interpreted in a certain way that are differently in that context than other religious traditions, given the Talmudic conversation that doesn't exist in other religious traditions. But that's an interesting. I have to look into that. There are tons of books. I mean, there are tons of, you go to Barnes and Noble or the great God Amazon and you type in, you know, caregiving for, our, and there's, I, I, I just, um, here, I just two, there's, here, there's, these are two, there's podcasts I'm doing with authors. So this is, this is, I'm, like, I'm interviewing her on Wednesday. Uh, this lady who wrote, why is grandma naked? Okay. So it's, it's, um, a, a you know, how to take care of somebody who's uh, in cognitive decline. And then here's one by wh wh who do you want to be when you grow old? You know, th th this all the same. Here's the problem with all these books. And, and there are tons of them, okay? Caregiving is an essentially personal enterprise. You could read all these books. Read all of them. You'll go crazy. But in the end, your situation is unique because your spouse or your child or your parent is unique. And while there may be you know, overarching issues, you're unique. And so you really have to tailor and, everybody, and, and people change. It's, that's why the challenge of, of, of caregiving is so overwhelming because it is a very personal, very personal life stage. <laughs> and then there's a social security question. I don't know if you can answer that, but the money being I, siphoned off and also how are we going to replenish social security? I don't know. Like um, the statistic I gave you from post-World War II from seven to one to right now, which is less, less than three to one. There's an economist, uh, Larry Kotlikoff, who's at BU, um, who wrote uh, The Coming Generational Storm. And uh, he really starts to analyze this and the fact that we really don't know about that social security um, pot that, you know, we keep hearing that oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But um, with less people paying into it and more people, you know, reaching into it now, 
uh, the, I've heard statistics that by the middle of the 2030s, it's going to be running out of money. Sooner or later, somebody's going to have to, in Washington, have the courage to deal with this and Medicare um, and Medicaid. Sooner or later, because there's just a finite amount, and you just can't keep going back to the same well. I'm not a politician, and believe me, I'm not an economist. But just in the books that I read and the studies I read and the two people I talk to just for my work, um, but nobody wants to touch it um, for a whole variety. We, you, we're so politically polarized uh, that you really can't, which I don't understand because all these people in Washington, they have moms and dads and half of them are siphoning it off the system themselves. So yeah. stay tuned. Any other questions? I think I just want to touch on a, a piece that that um, you brought up, Richie, and just to really, um, you know, maybe it's a nice way to to conclude or to end that um, when you speak, Rabbi, about the spiritual dimensions of caregiving, um, so often when I meet and talk with people who have gone, who are in, you know, stages of bereavement, stages of grief. Um, at the loss of a family member. Um, one of the pieces there is that they have served as a caregiver. And becoming a caregiver has called them to um, levels of depth and ability within themselves that they never knew that they possessed. Right. And the reality of having to set aside other aspects of their life to now attend to something that is something so core and so important, the care of a spouse, the care of a, of a parent, um, that at the end of a, a person's life, part of what they're grieving is that part of their identity that became a caregiver. Correct. Able to give at the most selfless um, level that they've ever been called to give. And, um, and in a way that they know will never be reciprocated and returned. And so um, while we look at caregiving, like you said, it's an involuntary stage of life that we really never want to have to go into, um, that there is that other piece too, that becoming a caregiver can bring an incredible sense of fulfillment of being able to reach beyond yourself that we may never have expected that we were capable of. And, um, you know, and, and that may be part of the story for people as well, that caregiving is extraordinary, extraordinarily fulfilling, even with all of the frustrations and the stress, um, that there's an extraordinary level of self-fulfillment that, that comes through too. A absolutely. And for some people, it becomes their identity. Yeah. And when, they, and when the need disappears, there's they walk into your office and say, yeah. this is who I was for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Who am I now? Mm -hmm. who am i and so i this subject it is a profoundly spiritual thing because you deal with the fundamental issues of what it means to be a human being and it touches us on the most primal level of 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 who we are as a human being it puts things in perspective in ways that we could never describe and we're totally unprepared for it because there's no there's no curriculum for caregiving being taught at, in schools you can't you can't you can teach ideas but until you walk the walk until you understand some of the things and and now with the pandemic when caregiving is sometimes done on a screen Right. You know? And that, that's why the mental health component of this is going to be with us for years. There, there is such a re, uh, delayed grief uh, uh, that's functioning in the country right now and in congregation that, that we're going to be dealing with the mental health component of this pandemic for the year. I've yet to talk to a mental health professional who hasn't validated this and said, you know, my practice is well, I can't take any more. Uh, this is so serious and across the generational lines. In fact, there's been studies, there's a Washington Post article right in the middle of the pandemic that said, contrary to what people think, it's baby boomers that are handling the pandemic much better than 
Gen Xers and my grandchildren. And I, and I will tell you from, uh, I'm in a second marriage. So my wife's, uh, her son, my stepson's family and my kids, in each one of those families, there's one kid uh, who's been very significantly affected by the pandemic. And, and those kids who need structure, who need, you know, routine, not every kid does, but there are a lot of kids who, they thrive in that. It's been taken away. Um, and the online virtual learning, as good as it is, it's, it's a cold medium. Uh -huh. it's, it's cold. Um, so this, this is going to be with us way after all we're vaccinated and herd immunized. But, uh, and so, I mean, that's why I, I mentioned before in the, in the, in that health and wellness little riff, that this is something that congregation is going to have to pay attention to because there's going to be a real need moving out of this, a, a, a real need, a real need. Anyway, any other last minute questions, concerns, comments? Once, twice, three times. Okay, I hope you're not all asleep. No, uh, not not at all. I, I, I want to thank you so much on behalf of uh, Rabbi Mil uh, Hochberg Miller and myself and our two congregations and friends who've joined us. Um, this has been, I would say, a wake up call. Uh, because yeah, the statistics people read in the paper and it doesn't necessarily hit home, but what you've said really, you know, has, has had a very, very profound impact, at least on me and I'm sure on, on everybody else who's been on this call, because as you said, there's gonna be an explosion of people with dementia and Alzheimer's, which is gonna affect families, caregivers, the government, I mean, our society in so Everybody. many ways. And as you said, we're not prepared for it. And I hope that this is the beginning of our preparation for it, both spiritually and economically. And, and as you said, the healthcare system is so inequitable and we really need to find ways of making sure people are gonna be taken care of. So thank well, you so much. My pleasure. Listen, you just do one, one relationship at a time and that's how you change the world. Don't, you know, just, it's like Pir Kayavod, just, you don't have to save the world. You just save your little, your little neighborhood, your little section of it, and everything will be okay. Again, if you'd like to touch base, jewishsacredaging.com. You can email me if you want to write for the website. We have people writing for it all over the place. So if you're interested in writing for the website on aspects of aging and spirituality of aging or personal stories, please feel free to do that. Uh, just send, send it to me. And you can send it to me at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. That's rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. Rabbis, cantors, everybody, stay safe, stay healthy, stay off the, the freeways as much as possible. And uh, the Dodgers don't need the World Series. They're, they're, they don't, just don't need it. Um, I, just, I just want to add something. We're recording this. And oh. uh, as soon as I get it up on uh, our YouTube channel, I will send out the link. I'll send it okay. to the, the rabbis on the call and they'll spread it around. Uh, also, um, I will share that document that we shared on the screen so that other people oh, yeah. have access to it as well. Um, so, Helen Kirschbaum for putting uh, in the chat the link to JewishSacredAging.com. So that is in the link as well. In our oh, cool. oh, thank, thank you, Alan. Way to go, dude. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a great resource. And people are already telling me that we should have you back again. So that'll probably happen. Yeah. It's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful presentation. Thank you so, so much. You'll be good, guys. Stay safe, stay healthy. That's the most important thing. Just stay healthy. You too. Be well. Thank you, Take everyone, care. for joining us this morning. So Thank glad you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice lunch. Thank you.